structure of this is going to take place. So the first initial bit, I'm going to talk you through some content, some core theory. And um, after that, we'll do some questions. And then it'll be sort of an open, uh, open Q&A type. Uh, yeah, we'll let you know. Today we're doing uh, the carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. So basic biological molecule stuff, which comes, uh, it comes up in most of the specifications. Um, there should be a class schedule available to you. It should be on the Zoom link. So this week we've got carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Next week we'll have immunity and disease, DNA and DNA replication the week after, exchange surfaces in animals, and the last, the last. bit will be practical investigations uh, for biology. And that's every Sunday. And then every Wednesday, we have chemistry sessions at six to seven. And uh, this Wednesday, upcoming Wednesday, will be periodicity, followed by energetics and equilibria, alkanes, alkenes, and alcohols, and then spectroscopy and interpretation. So if you want to come, you can come to both of those. Uh, there should be a link available to you. Uh, I can see if I can get it sent to the chat as well uh, for the chemistry sessions. I might do that after we've kind of gone through some of the stuff. If you just remind me at the end, I'll send you the link. Cool. I'll give it maybe one or two more minutes and then we'll get started because there still seems to be people in the waiting room. That's all the papers and that's the mark scheme. Okay. Uh, so hopefully you can all see my screen right now. Uh, let me know if you can't, if there's a problem with that. Uh, I will be teaching from mainly uh, AQA and OCRA, so it will be a mix of both of them. Uh, the content, though, most of the lessons will be sort of applicable to most exam boards. There will be a little bit that's specific to OQ, AC, OCRA and AQA, but um, most of the content should be applicable in most exam boards. We've picked topics that we know come across in most of the exam boards, so there is a bit of flexibility. And I think there was a questionnaire sent out where most students were taking either a AQA or OCRA anyway. Um, cool, uh, let's just get started. Let's jump straight into it. Uh, let me know uh, as we're going, if you have any questions, I will monitor the chat. It shouldn't be too bad. Um, but yeah, let me know if there are any questions as you're going through. So uh, characteristics of biological molecules. And uh, yeah, the session is one hour. Yeah. Okay. So stream sharing. that should work. Characteristics of biological molecules. And we'll talk about what a monomer and a polymer is. So. Biological molecules are the building blocks of biology. Most biological molecules are organic, so they're a mixture of carbon and hydrogen and, uh, yeah, so mostly carbon and hydrogen built building blocks, but you can have a variety of elements, including phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and nitrogen, calcium. Uh, an initial question I always tend to ask is I always say, if we had, um, if I gave you a molecule that had carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen in it, could you kind of identify which type of biological molecule it would be? And I'm hoping most people then would say it would be a protein because carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen as well, they would be uh, present in amino acids, which are the basic building blocks of protein. If I said, okay, what about a biological molecule with phosphate in it? 
I'm hoping most people would identify that that would be in a Uh, DNA, yeah, uh, DNA, uh, phospholipids as well. Those would be great, yeah, perfect examples. Um, so those would be kind of uh, the crucial, uh, the ability to identify the elements and the, their presence in uh, a specific molecule is really important in kind of understanding uh, biological molecules. So understanding which ones would be present in each of them would be really useful. The major classes that we'll go through today, we're going to focus on basically a carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins for this lesson. There will be an entirely separate session on nucleic acids and specifically on processes relating to nucleic acids. Uh, so starting basic polymers. Polymers are chains of monomers. So a monomer is a single uh, subunit, which is built together to form polymers. So polymers can either be homogenous. So for example, can anyone think of a homogenous polymer, a, a biological molecule, where there is only one repeating unit? Glycogen, yeah, that's a perfect example. Uh, amylose, cellulose as well. Cellulose is a beta glucose um, carbohydrate, complex carbohydrate. Those would be the best examples of homogenous polymers. Or they can be heterogeneous, where they consist of different types of molecules bent together. Um, bent together. Can we think of any types of heterogeneous, mole uh, heterogeneous polymers? Proteins. So some proteins, yeah. Uh, some proteins can be, proteins theoretically could be homogenous as well, but. Um, yeah, so most proteins will be heterogeneous because they'll be made from different amino acids because the amino acids will be based on the mRNA chain formed in transcription, which usually has different, uh, uh, different codons. So most biological molecules will be polymers. Remember, uh, monomers are what we need to make the polymers. So although the biological molecule um, biological molecules will be the polymers when we ingest because remember we can't just generate biological molecules from nothing biological molecules need to come from somewhere so when we take in the biological molecules they'll be polymers we will then break them down into the monomers absorb them into our bloodstream and take them around the body where we will then restructure them back into polymers the best example of this is when you eat a piece of bread, you have uh, loads and loads of carbohydrates in there, carbohydrates such as amylose, amylopectin, starches. Uh, you will break those down into uh, single carbohydrates, which you will then absorb into the bloodstream and use to build up glycogen in the liver to be stored as a long-term storage of carbohydrates. So an understanding of that is quite crucial. This is a great table, or probably one of the best tables I would recommend learning. Uh, so I would definitely take a note of this in some way. Uh, the type of biological molecules and their chemical compositions, because usually there are multiple choice questions in exams that do ask, okay, there is a molecule with sulfur in it, which type of biological molecule is it? And then you remember that it's a, 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 a protein. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to move on. Uh, the first thing we're now going to talk about polymers now. So formation of polymers and breakdown. So uh, polymers are mainly formed con from condensation reactions. Condensation, I'm sure you've heard that word mainly probably when it comes to windows. And condensation is sort of when water cools down on your windows and it forms that kind of nice uh, kind of wet pattern there. Uh, condensation in this case means the removal of water. So we take the water out of the polymer, uh, out of the monomers, and we then join them together with that bond in between. And remember the bonds have different names depending on what the biological molecule is. So you could it could be a glycosidic bond if it's between carbohydrates. 
It could be an ester bond if it's between in lipid. It could be a peptide bond if it's in protein. So yeah, removal of water. And now we create this covalent bond linking two monomers together. And so then the opposite of this, as I'm sure you're aware, is a hydrolysis reaction. Remembering to break this word down, lysis means anything is broken down. So um, photolysis means breaking down with light. Um, I don't know, other types of lysis that you'll probably come across in biology and chemistry, there, there are quite a few. A hydro, anything relating to water. So therefore we know that hydrolysis is the addition of water to break down a complex molecule. So the monomers are linked by this covalent bond. We add the water in and we break it down. Again, so that's kind of just kind of the basic principles that you should be aware of. So now we're going into the core content, carbohydrates, starting with monosaccharides. So mono meaning one, saccharide meaning sugar. So these are anything that is made of one sugar. Um, so in this lesson, we're going to learn that a monosaccharide is an example of a monomer and that monosaccharides will then be used to make carbohydrates. So uh, simple sugars are actually not a single thing. They're a umbrella term for both monosaccharides and disaccharides. And the, therefore they can function as small molecules. So monosaccharides include glucose, disaccharides, uh, which we'll talk in about next lesson. This includes galactose. Polysaccharides are your complex carbohydrates, uh, amylose, amylopectin, cellulose. Again, another monosaccharide, fructose, which you'll need to be aware of. And so the key monosaccharides that you should be aware of, glucose, fructose, and galactose. Um, disaccharides, which you should also be aware of, lactose and maltose, and then the complex carbohydrates include starch and cellulose. So remembering that again, simple sugars can be joined together to make polymers called complex carbohydrates, kind of basic understanding of that. Monosaccharides, simpler sugars, which are made of just one monomer, examples, glucose, fructose, and galactose. Can anyone think of a function of glucose? Monitor the chat for this. Yeah, it's used as a respiratory substrate. Yeah, it's it's used as the key respiratory substrate, um, and it is the most common uh, breakdown product in respiration. Um, they are organic compounds containing uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Interestingly, fructose can also be used in respiration. Fructose can be used in respiration uh, as a secondary breakdown product, so you basically convert fructose back into a hexose sugar and then reuse that. Uh, galactose can't, galactose has to be converted first. Uh, yeah, glucose therefore is involved in respiration, which releases energy in living organisms. Energy is key for any biological process. So any metabolic process, including uh, muscle contraction, pretty much anything you're gonna learn about in the next two years at some point will involve energy. Uh, glucose is a hexo sugar, hex meaning six, like hexagon is a six-sided shape. So hexo sugar, it has six carbon atoms. There are two isotopes of glucose, alpha and beta glucose. And basically the way I remember it <coughs> is alpha glucose has the H above, so A for above. Beta glucose has the H below, B for below. That's a good way of just trying to remember kind of the differences between them. Apart from them, they're fully identical. But that, that um, carbon on, on carbon one, that kind of difference affects its ability to form bonds, which is huge as it, that affects its ability to form complex structures. Uh, again, fructose is a pentose sugar. Galactose is also a hexose sugar. So fructose is a five carbon sugar. 
and understanding that that's the key difference between glucose and fructose. Oh, someone just entered the waiting room. Cool. So that's your knowledge of monosaccharides. Anyone got any questions so far? Just wait a second. No, okay, cool, we can move on then. Okay, uh, so now we'll talk about disaccharides. So di meaning two, like diatomic molecules, meaning molecules with two atoms. So di means just means two. So this is two sugars joined together. Um, common di disaccharide formation mechanisms. This is basically rote learning. You need to memorize uh, the equation to form a lot of the common disaccharides. Disaccharides are made from two monosaccharides joined together. Again, they can either be homogenous or heterogeneous. The disaccharides, again, are produced via condensation reactions between two monosaccharides. So, uh, and they'll be joined together by a glycosidic bond between the two monosaccharides. It's usually a 1,4 or a 1,6 glycosidic bond. And understanding the difference between them is huge. 1,4 is the bond between a carbon one so the first carbon and carbon four, or one six is between carbon one and carbon six. Uh, and, and this is crucial because as you can imagine, fructose and glucose reacting cannot have any one six bonds really because fructose doesn't have six carbons. So all of them will be one four bonds in glucose and fructose. So as you can see that removal of the water, so the full OH from one and the H from another, creating this bond and that and and the removal of water so common disaccharides that you need to be aware of will be alpha glucose plus alpha glucose gives you maltose alpha glucose plus fructose gives you sucrose and beta glucose plus galactose gives you lactose so slightly different uh, and, and those are the common ones you need to know. So can we think of some of the functions of these and where, where we can find them? So sucrose can be found as a sugar replacement. It is 10 times sweeter than sugar, interestingly enough, but it contains, because it contains less carbon, oxygen and carbon hydrogen bonds, it actually is less calories. So that's why it's used as a calorie-free sugar replacement for people on diets. Um, maltose can be found in malt and in barley and in really complex starches uh, and lactose in cow's milk. It's not necessarily in cow's milk, it's found in all milk. Um, so pretty much in formula, in breast milk, it's found in milk in general. And the reason it's found in milk is because it is a promoter of uh, good metabolism. And, and that's why uh, it, it, it's usually produced by animals mostly. It isn't really found that much in the animal kingdom, in the plant world. It's mostly just found in, in uh, animals. Yeah, okay. So as we can see, we've kind of now talked through the basics of simple sugars. Um, and we'll now move on to complex sugars and their functions. So polysaccharides, so we've now learned disaccharides and monosaccharides, poly meaning many, literally uh, like a polymer as many mers, a polysaccharide is many sugars joined together. And we're now gonna talk about the different types of polysaccharides. So, these are complex carbohydrates. They're made by the condensation of many glucose units. So loads and loads of glucose molecules or loads and loads of general sugar molecules. You can have uh, polysaccharides of, of different sugars. They don't necessarily have to be glucose. In, in your courses, you're probably gonna focus on the glucose ones, but again, it could be anything. Uh, their production involves the formation of, again, glycosidic bonds and water. Polysaccharides can be broken down back into disaccharides or constituent monosaccharides via hydrolysis reactions. And 
This is really important. This is what happens in Benedict's test for non-reducing sugars. Remember, in non-reducing sugars, we break down these complex carbohydrate, uh, carbohydrates. Can anyone remember what, uh, what we add uh, to stimulate that uh, breakdown reaction to occur in the test tube? If anyone's done this reaction so far? Yeah, it is acid. Uh, it'll be hydrochloric acid that we add, usually concentrated HCl. And then you put it in a water bath. Um, in humans, anyone can think of, there'll be a huge variety of enzymes that we use to do this. Uh, the, uh, the key one is amylase. Amylase can be pancreatic or uh, uh, sal salivary. And both of them will break down the alpha-1,4 and alpha-1,6 bonds in the polysaccharides. So again, this can be done in quite a variety of ways. Can uh, anyone name the uh, name the polysaccharide? Yeah. Yeah, this is cellulose. Uh, it's cellulose because characteristic beta glucose and alternating uh, its alternating structure. This alternating structure helps create really strong cross-linked microfibrils. And this allows cellulose to have loads and loads of strength, which means it's really difficult to break down, um, which is why cellulose is a key component of plant cell walls. So we're gonna probably touch on this again right now. Glycogen is a branched polymer made from many alpha glucose monomer units. Now, glycogen is, we know this is branched, uh, why the benefits of it being branched, which I'm sure all of you know, is that it me means that it's easy to snip and easy to uh, break down quite fast when it needs, uh, when it's needed, uh, which is controlled by hormonal control. And this is found in animal livers. Um, and it's a, so remembering that glycogen is actually not a long-term storage of carbohydrates. It's a short to medium store of carbohydrates only in humans. Whereas starch is in two ways. So it can be an amylopectin, which is the branch molecule, or it can be an amylose. Amylose is non-branch, but it's really tightly coiled. Now this allows for it to be a really good long-term store of, um, of carbohydrates. Why do humans not have a form of amylose? This is, a, this is sort of an AO3 type question. Why, why would humans not have a, have a form of uh, amylose on them? Anyone think? Takes too long to break down? Sort of. Uh, not really. Why do, why, let's think why humans, what, what do humans use instead as a long-term storage of uh, energy? That the plants don't really have. Yeah, uh, we have triglycerides, we have fats. Fats are an amazing long-term storage. They're way more calorie dense, they're way more energy dense than, uh, than carbohydrates are. So we've got fats to, to be our long-term storage, whereas uh, most plants tend to use starch as a long-term storage. So that's, that's kind of the key difference is why humans don't have amylose. Um, and then cellulose, as you know, is a polymer made from many non-branched beta-glucose monomer units, uh, which is connected to each other. They form loads and loads of strong cross-linked uh, microfibrils. Cool. So that is kind of just, we'll actually touch on this quickly, functions of each of these. So starch is the key energy store in plants and excess glucose is stored in this form. Starch, remember, is only... Uh, why are lipids better than amylose? Sorry, I've got a question here. Uh, lipids are much better than amylose because they are significantly more energy dense. So for the same amount, for the same mass of amylose that you have, you have almost double the amount of energy being stored in fat, which is why humans as a long-term energy store have evolved that. Also, humans need more protection. So remember, we've got loads of complex organs going on in here. Humans then use fat as a protective layer as well. It's also used for thermal uh, functions. It's used to keep us, keep us warm. There's, so 
it, it's a variety of reasons why lipids are better than amylose. Uh, but the big difference is uh, plants have cell walls, so they don't have the uh, osmotic problem that humans have with lipids. Uh, th th that's why humans need lipids is because human cell membranes need uh, more lipid to kind of hold them together, whereas plants have the cell walls to provide them with further structure. So there are differences in their requirements, which is why they, uh, they use different things as long-term energy stores. Okay, so what is the cell wall made of? Cell wall is made of cellulose. Uh, depends on who you're talking about, though. If you're talking about uh, plants, yes, it's cellulose. If you're talking about fungi, uh, then you'll probably be looking at talking about a peptidoglycan cell wall. So, oh, yeah, and chitin as well for some fungi. Peptidoglycan is also in bacteria. So, uh, yeah. And so there are a huge variety of differences uh, between which organisms have the cell walls. Okay, carrying on. So starch is the key energy store in plants and excess glucose is stored in this form. Starch is only found in plants and is insoluble. So it prevents the osmotic effects of swelling or bursting cells. Amylose has a structure therefore adapted for compact storage. So it stores a large amount of, um, th therefore you can have a large amount of amylose in a really short space. Oh, sorry, there are three people in the waiting room. Let me just admit more. So amylose has a structure adapted for compound storage, compact storage, and it can store a large amount of amylose in the same area. That, that's why it's unbranched and uh, has a coiled helix structure. Amylopectin, on the other hand, is very similar to glycogen. It has a storage, uh, it has a structure adapted for fast breakdown. So it's a branch chain of alpha glucose existing as long chains with branches uh, existing from a central backbone. And these branches can be snipped off quite easily. Glycogen is the key energy store in animals. Again, it's very, very similar to amylopectin in the sense that it's a alpha glucose in a branched arrangement. Big difference though, is although this image suggests they're very similar, glycogen is almost five times more branched than uh, amylose is. Uh, amylopectin is because it really is for fast breakdown. Uh, glycogen is used within minutes of, of requirement, whereas amylopectin is kind of somewhere in between. Oh my, so many people in the waiting room right now. Okay. Um, glycogen is stored in the liver. Its breakdown is controlled by the hypothalamus with the use of endocrine hormones. As a little bit of a brownie point, can anyone know, can anyone name the endocrine hormone that is used in the breakdown of glycogen? Uh, no, not insulin. Insulin is in the formation of glycogen. Glucagon, yeah, glucagon is uh, the hormone that's used in the breakdown of glycogen. So Sarah's eating a large meal. There's going to be a high glucose concentration in the blood. So insulin is going to be released. I'm not going to talk through this. This is an A2 biology thing. So I, and I don't know exactly if people are an A2 or an AS. So I'm not really going to discuss, touch on this in too much detail. But basically just understanding that insulin is when glucose is high. Glucagon is when glucose is low. And it causes the breakdown of glycogen. So again, glycogen has a structure uh, adapted for less for storage, more for fast breakdown. Uh, and it's more branched than amylopectin, making it far easier to break down. And the final thing just to talk about is cellulose. Cellulose is found in plant cell walls, providing structural support. It's made of beta glucose in long straight chains, and the chains form tough microfibrils giving it strength. Remember, what's crucial about the, uh, about the microfibrils is that they are all cross-linked. So they are all linked within themselves and linked to each other. Um, so that causes almost like layers of strength 
it's almost like trying to pull apart. It's almost trying to pull. It's it, the best analogy for this would be trying to pull apart. Uh, I don't know. Kind of try to think of something that's really, really like complex and layered. It's kind of trying to pull apart like a leaf. It, it's it's very difficult because it's got a lot of elasticity within it. It's like trying to pull apart a rope because of how it's coiled within itself. Literally, the 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 cross links mean that it is really, really tensilely strong. It is very difficult to pull apart because of those cross links. And but there is flexibility within cellulose. Now another bone, another like kind of a bit of a bonus point. I don't know uh, how many people know this. Um, why can't humans why can't humans properly eat plants why why do we find plants very chewy anyone know uh just as a response to an earlier question yeah it's cellulose um but there's something more specific than that yeah it's the lack of enzyme we don't have cellulase as the enzyme so we can't break down uh cellulose to answer the previous question, will we get access to the Zoom recording? I'm assuming you will. Uh, I don't know. Unfortunately, uh, I think Medic Mind will organize all of that. Maybe it'll be sent to the WhatsApp group if you guys are on that. I, I've got no idea how the system is going to work, but you should get access to it. Um, okay, lipids and triglycerides. So, uh, Structure of lipids and triglycerides, saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. Oh. Lipids have a variety of functions, i.e. in cell structure, metabolism, and animal immune systems. Yeah, lipids are almost arguably, in, in terms of crucialness in humans, it will go proteins, lipids, and then, uh, and then carbohydrates. Whereas in plants, it's the opposite way around. It pretty much goes, carbohydrates are probably the most crucial building block, then proteins, and then lipids. So there, there's slight, there are significant differences between plants and humans on this. But lipids have such a huge variety of functions. They're organic molecules containing carbon and hydrogen. So remember, they have um, fatty acid chains, and they have a glycerol head, basically. So triglycerides is one glycerol molecule bonded to three fatty acids. And I'm sure you can understand that because it's tri, tri meaning three, referring to the three fatty acids. Glycerol is an alcohol. Uh, there are three OH groups, three hydroxyl groups, and that makes it an alcohol. And fatty acids are, they have a carboxyl group. So they're a form of carboxylic acid. So now, now a lot of people maybe from their GCSE knowledge can start to see it. An alcohol plus a carboxylic acid makes an ester. So hence the bond between a, uh, the bond between a glycerol and a fatty acid is going to be an ester bond. In the name. So the R group, which is this kind of fatty acid tail bit, can either be saturated or unsaturated. Saturated fatty acid have no double bonds between the carbon atoms. Unsaturated fatty acids have at least one double bond between a pair of carbon atoms. Now, uh, another kind of, we're going back to bonus point questions. Why are unsaturated fatty acids considered unhealthy then? Why do doctors recommend not eating unsaturated fatty acids? Uh, LDL, no, it's, yeah, it can lead to coronary heart disease. It's to do with the fact that these unsaturated fatty acids have this double bond. And this double bond leads to something that are uh, I, I'm hoping people have heard of this, kinks within the chain. It basically means that rather than 
this fatty acid tail being a straight chain, what it ends up looking like is it ends up looking like kind of a bent chain. And this, this, this chain being full of kinks means that it's really difficult for that to be stored because a straight chain can be coiled or can be stored quite compactly. Whereas a unstraight, a kink chain can, uh, is much difficult to store. So it leads to buildup of these chains, which then leads to what, what will be coronary heart disease, plaque buildup, and they'll just be sitting kind of in the arteries and they'll just block them. So an understanding of that kind of saturated is saturated with single bonds, unsaturated has double bonds within it. Yep. So far, any questions? No, cool. Okay, uh, ester bonding, which I'm sure we've already time kind of touched upon is basically the bonding between a glycerol and the fatty acids and it's formed by a condensation reaction and this can be broken down by hydrolysis yeah so uh basically the r group uh of the fatty acid is the hydrocarbon chain uh, r group just means uh in in biology terms or even in chemistry terms it just means a variable group. It means a group that can change what, what it has. And because there isn't just one type of hydrocarbon chain on the fatty acid, um, they, that we refer to that as the R group of, of the fatty acid because it's variable. Okay, uses of triglycerides. This is probably one of the most crucial bits that you'll be asked about in your exams. Uh, Efficient energy storage. This is, I, I've said it a couple of times already, it's, it's so crucial. It's like the most important thing. And they're very, very efficient and store twice as much energy as carbohydrates in the same amount of space. It's, almost, it's, it's over actually, not even almost twice as much, it's over twice as much. Uh, saturated fats uh, depends. Like if that depends on whether they're low or high, uh, high density lipoproteins, but unsaturated fatty acids are more unhealthy. Uh, long chain hydrocarbons allow for a lot of chemical energy to be stored within them. Triglycerides are completely insoluble. So the fatty acid tails face inwards with the glycerol pointing outwards. This property is useful for triglyceride storage function because they do not affect the osmotic potential of the cell. Does anyone know the word where you have a hydrophobic end and a hydrophilic end? It's a similar word in chemistry, meaning two kind of perfect, yeah, amphiphatic. It means that there are two opposite ends. Uh, triglycerides are also the main food store in humans. So remember, our body readily consumes glute carbohydrates and sugars for rapid energy boost and stores most of our consumed food in the form of fat. Uh, remember, prokaryotes uh, have also uh, been shown to use triglycerides as a, river, as a reserve compound to store energy. So that's quite interesting. And they, form a, they kind of store them in the form of lipid droplets within their cells, which is quite interesting. Okay, uh, actually, I'm not gonna talk about that because we have another session on phospholipids in a couple of weeks. So we'll, we'll kind of skip it for now. Uh, the next thing is proteins and amino acids. So is everyone okay so far with kind of lipids, triglycerides and, um, and kind of carbohydrates? Any other questions? Okay, cool. Uh, proteins and amino acids. So structures of amino acids, uh, it's in the name. So they've got an amine group and an acid group. So a carboxyl end and an amine end. And remember amino acids are the monomers of proteins. There are about 60 amino acids and they're quite similar in structure. 
there are only about, sorry, there are only about 20 amino acids. Why are there 64 codons then? Let's see if anyone kind of is aware of this. Yeah, uh, perfect. Triplet code is degenerate. It's not degenerative. Degenerative means that it breaks down easily. It's degenerate, which means that there is uh, more than one codon per amino acid, which is really crucial because what it means is it means that uh, it means that you can code for a variety of amino acids from the same protein, and it protects against mutations because most simple mutations will then be not have an effect because the amino acid that will code for will be the same. So amino acids has this uh, general structure. This is probably not the structure that you're aware of and not the structure you'll be expected to draw in the exam. The structure you'll be expected to draw in the exam will be this. Does anyone who might be doing A2 chemistry uh, know why this structure has also been given? And while I continue drawing out the structure that is provided that you'll be expected in the exam. It's to do with, more to do with the fact that, um, I'll give, yeah, it's alkali hydrolysis. So this is to do with slightly different kind of, it's to do with the ability of an amino acid to act as a buffer, but you don't need to know that for your biology spec. What you need to be able to be, to be able to draw and to be aware of is this structure. So remember the R group is the variable group. So uh, what is the simplest amino acid? So the simplest amino acid is if it had just a H here. Yeah, glycine is the simplest amino acid. It's just if it has a H here and yeah. So one end has an amine group that's called the N terminus. N because it's a nitrogen terminus and the C terminus because it's carbon terminus, it's carboxyl group, the other end. And the variable R group differs and can also be used to categorize them. So you can have a really huge variety of categories for the amino acids. Yeah, so far we're okay. Continuing protein formation. So this is not, not protein synthesis particularly yet. It, we're just talking about peptide bond formation and uh, dipeptides and polypeptides and the differences between amino acids. So condensation reactions join amino acids together by forming peptide bonds between them. As a little bit of a brownie point, again, can anyone name the enzyme that will do this in uh, the process of translation? No. Polymerase uh, forms the phospholipid backbone. DNA helicase is not. DNA helicase breaks the hydrogen bonds. Lipase, no. Lipase breaks down fats. Lipase has nothing to do with proteins. Amylase, again, breaks down. Uh, amylase breaks down uh, carbohydrates. Uh, pepsin, pepsin breaks down proteins, not forms the uh, peptide bonds. Ligase, ligase uh, forms the uh, ligase forms joins between Okazaki fragments in uh, semi-conservative replication. Finally, someone's got it. Peptidyl transferase. Yeah, peptidyl transferase is the enzyme that forms peptide bonds in translation. Uh, I would recommend noting that down. It is quite an important thing to know. Uh, there's usually a mark in it in a mark in every mark scheme. Um, and as we know, this is done by condensation reactants, joining amino acids together, forming peptide bonds between them. These reactions can form dipeptides or polypeptides. So as we know, yeah, this is happening. Uh, yeah, uh, obviously they haven't drawn any of the bonds in here, but you know the principle. Remember, this is actually the only one where it's quite important to know. The hydrogen, the OH comes from the carboxyl end and the hydrogen comes from the amine end. You do need to be aware of that. Um, 
And so it forms this, which is uh, an amine bond or a peptide bond, which is a join between a carbon and a nitrogen. There is no oxygen, you know, like how we had the ester bonds with the O intermediate, and that was the same with glycosidic bonds. With amino acids, it's different. There is the amine bond has, or the peptide bond is a direct join between a carbon and a nitrogen. Yeah, perfect. And hydrolysis is broken, is the process of breaking this down. And a lot of the enzymes that I've heard mentioned, pepsin, protease, protease enzymes, loads of protease enzymes, those are going to mediate this hydrolysis reaction. Remember the R group is uh, the thing that separates uh, amino acids. Glycine is the smallest amino acid. So it's R group is just a hydrogen atom. You don't need to know all of these uh, amino acids. The ones that you might want to kind of know probably will be glycine. Will you probably want to know a methionine? You'll want to know. Does anyone know why you'll need to know methionine? And I'll explain the last one. Uh, and 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 cysteine. Yeah, uh, methionine is the start codon. Uh, cysteine is uh, the one you'll need to know because that's the only amino acid that forms disulfide bridges. So being aware of those three would be quite good. I'm, it's not on anyone's spec though. So it's just something that might be good knowledge just to have. Okay, so we'll now quickly touch on the four layers of protein structure. I'm actually gonna do this without the slides because I think it would be more effective just to quickly run through the four layers. So the primary layer or the primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. Once they've been joined, they have no, um, they've taken no overall shape yet. They've done no protein folding yet. People are still joining. It's like 48 minutes past. Okay. Uh, primary structure is the kind of sequence of amino acids all joined by the peptide bonds. There's no overall structure to it yet. The secondary structure is the folding of this primary structure into either an alpha helix, which I can see if they have a diagram for. Yeah, an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. And this is really important because this determines what the tertiary structure is going to be. Usually alpha helixes tend to form which type of protein? Globular, yeah. And beta pleated sheets tend to form uh, fibrous protein. So, okay, no worries. Uh, yeah, so alpha helixes tend to form uh, globular proteins. Beta pleated sheets tend to form uh, fibrous proteins. Tertiary structure is basically just a 3D interaction of all of this. For a lot of proteins, this is the end. Some proteins will have quaternary structures, which is the interaction of different chains. So remembering that one chain gets to a tertiary structure, tertiary structure gets to a quaternary structure if they interact with different chains. So for example, hemoglobin, or actually specifically the globin protein in hemoglobin is made up of four uh, polypeptides, two alpha chains and two beta pleated sheets. Yeah, so just understanding that. Uh, yeah, so remember primary structure is flat in 2D. Alpha helix is formed due to coiling, whereas beta pleated sheets form due to folding. And then the tertiary structures, the tertiary structure is to do with more co coiling and folding. And there are four types of bonds, ionic, disulfide, hydrophobic, and hydrogen bonds. Uh, ionic bonds are the formation of electrostatic interactions, which will then contribute to the folding. Disulfide bridges are covalent bonds between cysteine and hydrophobic or hydrophilic interactions occur between either non-polar or polar amino acids. Um, which one is most susceptible to pH? Which one of these bonds? Ionic, perfect. Yeah. Uh, ionic bonds break very easily when objected to pH. And basically that causes protein denaturing. The tertiary structure might be the final structure if there was only one polypeptide chain, but remember quaternary is how different polypeptide chains come together. So we can have dimers, 
two pro chains, trimers, three chains, tetramers, four chains. And you can either have homomers or heteromers. So remembering hemoglobin therefore is a tetrameric heteromer. So four different chains, which are non-identical. Bit of a mouthful that. Don't need to know that much detail though. Okay, this usually comes up as a five to six mark question. So being aware of a lot of this would be quite useful. Structure and function of globular proteins, hemoglobin, and then structure and function of fibrous, and then collagen is your key example. So 3D proteins are proteins with tertiary and quaternary structure. They can either be classified as globular and fibrous proteins. So globular, globe-like, so round structures, spherical. Hydrophobic parts of the protein fold inwards. So remember, this has hydrophilic R groups on the outside. That's one mark usually in an exam uh, when you're talking about the differences. So remembering that hydrophilic are in, out on the outside. They also have a variety of metabolic roles. So they, they are basically your enzymes, transport proteins, and messenger proteins. They're more for function rather than structure. Remember, they also tend to also then be able to have high specificity because of this round shape that they've got. Bec they are also soluble. Remember, because they have, going back, going back, hydrophilic parts on the outside, they are water soluble, which means that they, sorry, no, they are lipid soluble, so they can cross cell membranes. An example of this is hemoglobin, which transfers oxygen. The solubility of, uh, yep, yeah, so again, more going into the examples. Hemoglobin is a quaternary protein, four tertiary globular subunits, two alpha, two beta chains, and then they are bonded to a heme group. Heme is not a protein, therefore it's called a prostat prosthetic group, which we'll talk about more when we do a lesson on enzymes. And heme contains the iron ion. Hemoglobin is considered a conjugated protein because there is a heme, uh, the protein is conjugated with a non-protein structure. So remember, fibrous proteins are long polypeptide chains that twist around each other. Uh, they are water insoluble. The hydrophobic parts are folded away from the external environment. They do not function well in metabolic roles. They are structural proteins because they are stable and unsoluble. So examples, keratin and collagen, Keratin, hair and nails. Collagen is a type of connective tissue. Remember, fibrous proteins usually have high tensile strength because they're quite strong because of the strong coil, coiling of their chains. Uh, collagen has three pro-collagen subunits that are coiled around each other, and they have hydrogen and covalent bonding between uh, within that coiled structure and it's present as fibers. Different types of collagen can be found almost everywhere in the body. We have like loads and loads of different types of collagen, which you don't really need to worry about that much. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of proteins, uh, lipids, and carbohydrates. I normally now would move on to exam questions, but since we have only about five minutes left, I'd much rather open the floor to any and all questions about this topic, anything that you're struggling with currently, or um, anything that you want to ask. Secondary and tertiary, I'm assuming you mean protein structure. So secondary is the initial folding and coiling, whereas so it's still 2D overall. It, it, isn't, it hasn't reached a full 3D structure yet, whereas tertiary is the overall 3D structure of a protein. Anyone else? I'm sure people have any questions. It doesn't have to be about uh, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, even if it's something you guys are just doing at school right now. Are all triglycerides esters? All triglycerides have ester bonds. I guess in a way, yeah, they are triesters they are, uh, because they have three ester groups. So uh, by that point, yeah, they are all esters. I mean, I wouldn't really call them esters in an exam, but 
if if it helps you visualize what they what their structure is, then yeah, they are asterisks. Would this question be paper be emailed to us? It's available free on the internet. So if you go on via uh, study, if you just go into studymind.co.uk forward slash resources, go into biology, pick your spec. So let's say you're doing AQA. And let's say you want, and you've got question papers and mark schemes for everything. So you should be able to access these anywhere. So you don't really need them emailed to you. I can put the link in the chat if that would help anyone, just to me. And they've got things for biology and for chemistry. Class papers for both of them. What are prosthetic groups? So prosthetic groups are non-proteins, non-protein groups that are associated with a protein and help them perform their function. The best way I think about this is, I don't know if people know like a biological prosthesis. So a prosthetic biologically is a, when you have an amputation, and there's a replacement with a non, sort of, it's not, a, it's not the same organ, it's just a replacement with something else that can function in a similar way. And that's basically what a prosthetic group is. It's something that's not protein, but it helps the protein function. So without the pro without the prosthesis, the, the function would be diminished. So it could be an ion, it could be something that is just non-organic, it could be anything. And there are loads of prosthetic groups, but we'll touch more on them. Cofactors versus coenzymes. Uh, yeah, it's to do with which one is organic and which one is not. So a cofactor is not organic. So it's not really an organic type of molecule. So it doesn't contain carbon, hydrogen, or oxygen as their key building blocks. A coenzyme usually will be organic. That's the key difference. Are cofactors chemically bound uh, to the enzyme? Yes, cofactors are also chemically bound to the enzyme. Uh, whereas prosthetic groups aren't. That's the crucial bit, uh, I think, from, from what I remember, yeah. Prosthetic groups are not chemically bound. Cool. Any last questions? Otherwise, you are free to go. Feel free to stay behind, and if you want to ask me a question, I'll stay on for a bit. So, cheers. No worries. I hope to see more people on Wednesday uh, for the chemistry session. Uh, past paper questions, I sent the link in the chat earlier. Uh, the recording uh, should be sent to you by Medic Mind in some way. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to happen, but uh, they will probably send it over to you. Now, obviously, the chat won't be part of the recording. So uh, if you have said anything in the chat, you'll, don't worry about that. Cool. Again, feel free to stay behind and ask me any questions you've got. I've got nothing better to do, so. Do I have any exam tips? Uh, yeah, I would say, um, I, think it's, I think it's quite like, uh, th there's a lot you could do for exams. Past paper questions are the best way because you need to learn 
exactly what the examiners are looking for. Because usually the biggest stumbling block for most students isn't not knowing what they're talking about. It's not having an ability to put that into words, which therefore is gonna be a bit, like it's a bit more of a struggle. So I would say do, ex do as many exam papers as you physically can. Um, also having a knowledge slightly beyond what the specification is looking for usually benefits you because what it does is it helps you approach questions that you won't be familiar with. Um, so for example, they usually like to, especially in biology exams, they usually like really like to ask about the most random stuff. Like they, I, I remember one year they asked about like the naked mole rat and his pain receptors. Now, if I hadn't had like a decent knowledge of the nervous control system and how proprioception and pain work, which really isn't really on the spec, I would probably wouldn't have been that able to answer that question, which is weird because surely they could only ask you what's on the spec, but by, they, they technically did ask me what's on the spec, which was the nervous control, but they put it in a way that if you weren't aware, you wouldn't probably be able to answer it. So read up on your biology, be, be good. Yeah. And it'll help you going forward as well, knowing good biology. Yeah. No worries. Uh, I hope to see you on Wednesday then uh, for chemistry. No worries. No problem. Anyone else got any questions? Sorry, sorry, you guys just joined. The lesson is now finished. Uh, so, oh, there are people still trying to join. Uh, let them know. Hey, sorry for whoever has just joined. Again, lesson's now finished. I'm just waiting if anyone has any questions, but yeah. If there's nothing else I can help you with, I'm going to end the meeting. Right, cool. I'm going to end the meeting there. Thanks, everyone. I will see you next week.